Okay, hi. Um, so I'm Victoria and I'm from Maseric University in Brno. I am a PhD candidate there and um, I work mostly with Kubernetes. So I will try to show you how we are trying to implement Checkpoint Restore into Kubernetes and the whole environment and why we actually want it. So my um, doctorate research is focused on improving resource utilization of uh, container clouds in Kubernetes. And for that, we want to use the Checkpoint Restore. And uh, to give you the context of the environment where I work, uh, so I work with uh, Kubernetes clusters that are operated by Czech National E infrastructure. And uh, they are not very small, they have like some non-trivial resources, and they are accessible by all academic users of the Czech Republic. And uh, these clusters have become very popular with uh, all researchers because on one hand, they, like containers inherently provide reproducibility and, and this is considered crucial for research across all domains. And on the other hand, the cloud and containers also provide elasticity, so um, that is handy for indecisive users and also for the workloads where we don't know their resource consumption beforehand. However, um, because it's the academic environment, there is a really large variance of the workload types, which naturally leads to pretty high variance in the resource requests, which inevitably leads to the low clusters uh, utilization, as I will show in a bit. And that's pretty ineffective for us because in the end, we have to pay for all the electricity, but the clusters have not been really used effectively. So the high variance of the workload types can be characterized by a simultaneous existence of many different workload types alongside classic static applications, such as some websites or runners, there exist containerized HPC workflows um, such as bioinformatics pipelines that can run for multiple hours and they uh, depend on the successful finish of all tasks in one step before another step starts. Then uh, another very big and popular workload type are interactive workloads or interactive systems. In our environment, uh, Jupyter Hubs are very popular. Those are some interactive web-based environments that are very much used by researchers. And the instances of these, mm, like not Jupyter Hubs, but the notebooks, the, the single user servers, they almost always have very different resource requests. Another type of interactive workloads are virtual desktops and they always need to allocate a GPU and their deployment consists of uh, multiple containers. And some other workload types are resource intensive computations. For example, there is this uh, one containerized software called CryoSpark, which is a software for cryo electron microscopy. And it always needs a uh, 80 gigabyte GPU and actually uses it. Or long running computations where uh, uh, these computations may or may not be resource intensive, but they need to run without interruption for many hours, days, weeks. Uh, we even had one instance of AlphaFault, which is a software for predicting protein structures that uh, took six months, and we had to somehow make sure that it was not really interrupted. And uh, <laughs> here you can see the actual state of our cluster. And this is from this week, but it looked like this for two years now. So in the upper part, you perhaps see it, but it's visible that uh, the whole cluster has some uh, reported uh, CPU requests, but the actual utilization is far, far lower, something like 3%, which is pretty pathetic. And the same, and a trend can be seen on the node level where we can see that the uh, like ratio between CPU resource requests and actual um, like utilization of these requests is always less than 50%, but like 98% of the time is less than 20%. 
So it's visible that users just allocate resources, but either don't use them because they allocate it maybe to be sure that nothing breaks, which is uh, like a relict from batch computing, or they had to allocate them because the most intensive part of the computation just requires so many resources and you need to allocate for that. And on the very specific level, which is like uh, left down, this is the specific example of the Jupyter hubs where we can see that users um, allocate something like two weeks of CPU time or five days, 14 hours, but actually use 45 minutes of CPU time or 50 minutes of CPU time. And uh, we are very set about this and would like to use the checkpoint restore to do it better. And uh, so with the example of Jupyter Hubs, because we operate multiple instances of them, it, this uh, ineffective resource usage is pretty prominent for us. Uh, but the advantage of this system is that every user who spawns a container uh, like it gets a single container and therefore we can already uh, checkpoint and restore this uh, via Kubernetes and together with the help of Radostin we were able to test this, the both checkpoint and restoration and we verified that the restoration happens just right. So uh, for now we are planning to integrate the checkpoint restore directly into the Jupyter Hub, or, but it would be better in Kubernetes. And we want to, in the end, offer the checkpoint restore to users as an option to suspend their notebook in, when they are not working it anymore or know that like, they are going on holidays. And it would save us resources and for them it would be better because they can save the whole state of the container. Sometimes they start the computation but just don't finish it and if they lose all the progress, um, they're unhappy. And from our point of view as infrastructure providers, we can suspend their notebooks if they see there is no activity but also don't want to cause user problems because uh, they are not exactly happy when we just kill their containers and uh, this is also like one of the biggest things they don't like about the badge environment. And uh, with this example, we can see that like single, single container checkpoint restore use case is somehow feasible now. I'm omitting all like storage checkpoints and network checkpoints because that's whole another chapter. But if we want to checkpoint and restore something like MPI jobs or the virtual desktops, uh, we have no easy way to do this right now because it's a distributed checkpoint. And uh, that's what Radosti knows. So um, container checkpointing has been introduced in several different container engines, for example, Podium, Docker, LXC, um, and more recently in Kubernetes, the container orchestration platform. And the main difference is that uh, container engines are typically run on individual hosts where they run specific containers. And when we introduced checkpointing in Kubernetes, we essentially used a similar approach where we can checkpoint individual containers. However, our Kubernetes is often used to deploy and scale distributed applications that could be running on many different nodes. And the question is, how can we enable checkpointing for this type of application, for distributed applications? And in particular, the fundamental problem is that CRU is designed to checkpoint individual process trees, individual containers. This is, for example, in contrast to other uh, tools such as DMTCP that uh, have uh, essentially what is known as barriers, um, different, uh, different steps during the checkpointing and the restore process where synchronization is enabled. Um, so how can we adapt CRU to enable this type of uh, synchronization or orchestration during the checkpoint and restore process? And how can we synchronize different CRU instances? These are the main questions we were focusing on. Um, so what does it mean to create a global, consistent global checkpoint? Um, this is a checkpoint that essentially is a collection of multiple container checkpoints. Um, and um, the, main, the main problem that we want to solve is to um, 
make sure that the sequence of events, the normal se sequence of events is not broken. So, for example, if you have container B sending a message to container A, and the checkpoint for container B is created before the message is sent, but the checkpoint for container A is created after the message has been received, this creates what is known as inconsistent state because the, the global checkpoint has received a message that has never been sent. So this is the main problem that we want to solve. Um, and to enable our container checkpointing well, for distributed applications with Kubernetes, with CRIO and Kubernetes, essentially we focus on, um, we introduce a new tool called CRIO Coordinator that uh, uses the action script functionality in CRIO to um, pause the checkpointing at uh, particular steps. So these steps are known as action script hooks. So in this example, we have a um, configuration file that specifies the um, uh, destination server where um, the CRIO coordinator synchronizes different CRIO instances and um, it specifies dependencies between different containers. This configuration file could be either specified by the user or uh, generated by the container runtime. Um, Creo, um, when Creo starts, it will execute this action script at every uh, action script hook. In this case, the pre-dump hook is executed before the checkpoint starts. This is when all checkpoints are synchronized. And then after um, all containers have reached this step, it will continue and create the actual checkpoint. And post dump hook is at the end of the checkpoint to synchronize that the checkpoint has been successful for all containers. Um, in addition, we introduced a, an action script hook called pre-stream that allows us to essentially create an image streamer and uh, essentially stream all the checkpoints to a single location. So this is, for example, um, it avoids the overhead of writing a checkpoint to local disk and then transferring to the destination server to create a global consistent checkpoint. Um, and the restore functionality works in a similar way. So um, the pre coordinator tool is executed as an action script and then it synchronizes a different steps. And I want to show a demo how this works. You've got about 30 seconds. Um, the demo is quite short. Right. Cool. So um, in this case, we have two servers, server 1, E1, and E2. Uh, we start two counters on server 1. Um, and when we, um, so in this case, we show the um, configuration file for CRIO coordinator. It has the address of the coordination server and it has the dependency between uh, the first and the second process. And then when we call CRIO dump with the PID of the first process, it will, um, it will uh, reach the uh, pre-dump hook uh, where it will execute the CRIO coordinator and it will wait until essentially the second checkpoint process starts. Uh, in the meantime, the processes will continue to run. And then when the second process is reached, um, performs the checkpoint, it will synchronize both checkpoints and create a consistent checkpoint. And then during restore, it works in a similar way. So essentially we um, start the restore and then it will wait until um, essentially all dependencies are satisfied and then it will perform the restoration. Um, and thank you for listening. Um, in summary, we introduced a new tool called CRIO coordinator that enables distributed checkpoints with checkpointing with CRIO and um, it uses action script to integrate with CRIO and to enable uh, the barriers um, of synchronization. And handling of TCP connection is something that we want to explore in the future because in Kubernetes, the network namespace is allocated to a pod, to a group of containers, and there is a locking mechanism that we need to introduce to handle uh, established TCP connection. Thank you, and I'll
hope, hope we have to answer any questions.